pale blue dot. So back in the early 1990s, oh yeah, the lights would be great. Uh, the Voyager made it outside the solar system about four billion miles away. And then Carl Sagan asked as a special favor to him if they wouldn't turn the thing around and take a picture of the Earth from four billion miles away. And so this is a, one of the frames, it took a bunch of frames and one of the frames, this one, right there, uh, there's a little dot in there, and that's Earth with the, next to the sun. And uh, that's it, a tiny, can you even see it? A little pixel, so that's it, a little blue dot floating on a, what looks like a sunbeam from the reflection of the lens for the camera. And this really affected a lot of people, including Carl Sagan. And Carl Sagan had a few words to say about this, a few years later as he was given a lecture at a university. And so I think it's kind of interesting what his take on it was from a naturalistic perspective. And then how do we respond from a Christian perspective to uh, what is apparently completely insignificant? And um, so this is a video clip. Voyager's wide and narrow field cameras captured this mosaic of the solar system. One of the frames was a view of Earth engulfed by a ray of sunlight, our planet from 3.7 billion miles away. It's just a tiny little bright pixel. You can't really make out continents or oceans. It's just, you know, it's like home is just so far away. The pale blue dot captured the imagination of the world. And in 1994, Carl Sagan shared his reactions to the picture during a lecture at Cornell University. We live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star lost in a galaxy, tucked away in some forgotten corner of a universe in which there are far more galaxies than people. But consider again that dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, every hero and coward, every peasant and king, every young couple in love, every mother and father, every hopeful child, every inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species live there on a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. So he, he paints a pretty bleak picture, right? No, no help is coming from elsewhere to help us save ourselves, and we're just a little, little speck of nothing. And so what's the point, really? And so, um, and, it, and from a certain perspective, it looks like we're pretty much nothing. I mean, it, we're kind of almost irrelevant. Uh, from the look of things. Uh, this is a picture here of galaxies in a single pinprick of space that with a telescope looks out and sees all these galaxies. 
And uh, it's estimated now that there are around two trillion galaxies in the visible universe. We can't even see the whole universe, right? But just in the visible universe, there's about two trillion galaxies, right? And each of those galaxies has a, about 100 billion stars. So there's about 200 uh, billion trillion stars in the visible universe. And ours is just one of those. <laughs> and uh, just so to wrap your mind around it a little bit, there's more stars than grains of sand on the planet, right? And the whole Sahara Desert, all the beaches in the world, there's more stars. There's only seven million trillion grains of sand. There's, uh, <laughs> there, there's uh, uh, what did I say, uh, 200 billion trillion stars. So there's, there's hundreds of billions of trillions more stars than sand grains. So that it uh, kind of makes you think, well, we're, we're pretty even more insignificant. Uh, than we previously imagined. And uh, here's a, a, just a picture of our Milky Way. And uh, again, there's 200 billion trillion stars, 7 million trillion grains of sand. So it kind of, wow, that's a lot of galaxies. Um, so from the Christian's perspective anyway, it, it seems like an extraordinary amount of attention is paid to a little pale blue dot. Uh, from the uh, uh, design perspective, if you want to put it that way. For example, uh, this dot is placed in just the right spot in the galaxy. Uh, it's not too close to the middle where there's too much radiation for life. It's not too far away where there's not, not enough heavy metals and uh, materials to support complex life. It's also not in the middle of an arm of a galaxy. It's between two arms so that we can see out and study the universe. If you're in the middle of an arm, you wouldn't be able to see out very well. Wouldn't be able to study it. Also, this blue dot, the Earth, happens to have an almost perfect circular orbit around the sun. That's fairly unique. I mean, almost entirely unique. Uh, and what would happen if the orbit was more elliptical? It would get too hot, then too cold, and too hot, and too cold. So it's just right that it's a, a almost perfectly circular orbit so that the temperature remains fairly constant. Is Earth the most, most circular of all of the planets? Oh, yeah, by far, oh, wow. except for the moon, which we'll get to in a minute. <laughs> and uh, also the Earth has a, uh, an iron core that spins around, and, and it creates a field, magnetic field, which uh, prevents the solar radiation from stripping away our atmosphere. And that's very nice, too. Otherwise, we'd be like some other planets that don't have that, like Mars, for example, and we wouldn't be able to live very well. And also, the, the moon is very interesting because the moon almost has a, is the perfect size and shape, or not shape, but perfect size and distance from the, from the Earth to keep the uh, oceans uh, circulating properly and keep them uh, from going stale on us. It also has a almost perfectly circular orbit as well, which is, which is nice because uh, the Earth has a tilt on its axis. And the tilt on its axis, uh, at least with our current atmospheric conditions, uh, it helps to uh, keep the Earth uh, uh, more regulated as far as temperature is concerned. If it was straight up and down, it would get too hot and too cold in different parts of the planet. But if it's tilted slightly, 23 degrees, then it, uh, it helps uh, regulate the temperature more evenly around the planet. Especially, I think before the flood, the atmosphere may have been different than it is now. But given things like it is now, the perfect tilt of the planet is nice to be maintained. And, but without the moon, you wouldn't be able to maintain that tilt. Without the moon going around the, the Earth, maintain, the Earth maintains the tilt of the Earth. If the moon wasn't there, the Earth's tilt would vary about 85 degrees you know, all over the place, and it would be chaotic. That's why you wouldn't be able to kind of settle down anywhere. <laughs> So it's, it's really nice that the, that the moon stabilizes the planet like that. It's also uh, a nice bonus, if you want to uh, say it that, that the diameter of the moon is about 400 times smaller than the diameter of the sun, but the moon is about uh, 400 times uh, let's see, uh, farther from the Earth than, or the sun is 400 times farther from the Earth than the moon is. And so when there's an eclipse, the moon almost perfectly covers the sun so that you can study the atmosphere of the sun and learn more about the sun. It's like a nice set up scientific experiment that way. 
that's just kind of a nice bonus. And you're like, well, any of these things could have happened by random chance, right? But you start adding up dozens and dozens and then hundreds of these things, and you start thinking, man, this, is, this seems to, like a setup, right? That they, we were just made just right for all these nice things to happen here. Uh, here's just some more pictures of, of the eclipse and solar flares that we can study because of the, the perfect fit of the moon over the sun. Uh, the sun is also uh, has an extraordinary stable energy output. You might not think that sometimes with some of the news on flares and stuff like that. But it's a very stable energy output. It's also the right temperature and color uh, to support life on this planet and photosynth photosynthesis properly uh, to maximize that. And also the planets themselves are very helpful, especially like Jupiter. It's considered the vacuum cleaner of the solar system. And uh, how, you know we've seen the, that Jupiter takes hits a lot and covers us because if it wasn't for Jupiter, we'd be a lot more bomba bombarded with asteroids and, and comets and things. But it, so it protects us. So that's kind of nice. And um, the uh, life on the planet is balanced very nicely. So, you know we breathe out oxygen and plants breathe it in. And uh, I'm sorry, we breathe out carbon dioxide and plants bring that in, and then they breathe out oxygen, and we breathe that in, right? And so that's a nice, perfect balance. How did that get set up? And uh, so we can get more into that later, but I'm just trying to show you that there's a lot of very fine-tuned features of this planet. Also, the water on this planet that makes the planet blue is very inter interesting because uh, there's some unique things about water. Uh, water is... Uh, uh, absorbs 4,184 joules of heat to rise one de kilogram of water one degree Celsius, right? So um, comparison sake for like say uh, copper, it's 10 times less energy needed to raise one degree, one kilogram, one degree. And so because of this uh, temperature absorption quality of water, it regulates the temperature of the whole planet. So it's not too hot, not too cold, which is very nice. So. Again, uh, water is a universal solvent because it dissolves more substances than any other liquid which is required for organic life. Uh, it's less dense as a solid than as a, uh, as a liquid, which is nice. And uh, most things aren't like that. Because what would happen if a uh, solid like ice was more dense than water, liquid water? Then it, the ice would sink in the wintertime, fill up the lakes, and uh, kill everything, right? <laughs> so it's nice that it floats. And uh, we already talked about the specific heat that's uh, unique to water, that, that's, uh, that has such a, a unique specific heat that it does. Also, the surface tension and capillary action of water is very nice, very fortunate, because how do plants, uh, you know, when you take a little capillary tube and you stick it into water, the water goes up the tube against gravity, right? And so this is nice for plants because Plants don't have to use energy to pump water all the way up to the top of a 300-foot tall tree uh, to, uh, to water itself. So that's an interesting thing about water as well. And um, there's also special things about the universe. We can, there's, we can only talk about a few of these things because uh, there's just not time. I mean, there's hundreds of these things if you look them up. Um, but the precision of the Big Bang is probably the most precise thing that's known right now. And the precision of the Big Bang, it didn't just, in order to have the entropy, the, the energy needs that we can function with now for the sun to shine, all the stars to work, and our planet to function as it does, the bang at the beginning of the universe couldn't just like randomly bang. It had to bang very precisely. And the precision of the bang had to be precise in one part to 10 to the power of one, uh, or 10 to the 10 to the 123. And uh, that number, to write it down, you'd have to say 1 in 1, 0, 0, 0. And to write all those zeros down, there's 10 to the 80th atoms in the universe. You'd have to write 40,000 zeros on every atom to write the number down. So that's extreme precision. Uh, the precision of the expansion of the universe, like everything's flying away from each other, all the planets, all the galaxies, are flying away at a certain speed. Because if it flew away too fast, you wouldn't have uh, heavy uh, or complex molecules form or heavy metals or anything like that. And if it flew away too slowly, everything would crunch back down on itself and annihilate itself. And so it has to fly away at exactly the right speed, and the precision of that expansion is one 
and 10 to the 123. So again, 10 to, 10 to the 80th atoms in the universe, so more precise than the number of atoms in the universe. So also antimatter is a big problem uh, because antimatter pretty much doesn't exist in this universe. It's very rare. Uh, you have to kind of artificially make it most of the time. And so if you believe in the Big Bang that is totally natural, uh, uh, um, a natural Big Bang, you would expect equal amounts of matter and antimatter to be produced. Well, that would be a problem because every time antimatter hits matter, what happens? Kabloof, right? It goes back to energy, pure energy. And so why are we here? This is a huge question in physics today is why are we here? Because where's the antimatter? And they're trying to say, well, maybe there's slight differences between matter and antimatter that made matter survive and antimatter not survive. But there's not. They've studied it down to one part in 10 billion or something like that, and they're identical as cut for charge. You know, there's a positron versus electron, and uh, you have uh, uh, everything's the same except for charge is opposite, but everything else is the same, exactly the same. Also, the universe appears to be written in the language of mathematics so that we can actually understand it. It's logical, it's predictable, it's testable. Uh, we can do science here. And it didn't have to be designed like this. It could have been completely ununderstandable, completely mysterious. And this is one of the things that baffled Einstein a bit because Einstein's pretty much uh, an atheist. And so he says the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it is comprehensible. You know, and so it's like it's, it's made, it seems designed for intelligence to appreciate it, which is uh, uh, kind of fascinating. And so, and other physicists realize this too. Sir, Sir Roger Penrose, uh, he's uh, um, talked about this. He says the extreme high level of fine tuning astronomers and physicists discern powerfully suggests purpose behind the universe. So what's the answer for this from the uh, naturalistic perspective? And so, here is Lawrence Krauss. In 2012, he wrote a book called A Universe from Nothing, right? So a universe just popped itself into existence from nothing. Well, well, not exactly nothing, but mostly nothing. And so he said, well, because of this, there's like an infinite number of universes out there, and ours just happened to pop right, basically, right? And so that's why we can expect that, that we can be here and that everything is just perfectly balanced for us to exist and us to enjoy is because there's infinite numbers of other universes that didn't turn out quite right and ours just happened to turn out right. So that's the answer. And same thing with Stephen Hawking. He came up with this idea on M theory and the M really doesn't stand for anything. It, it can be magic or mother or whatever you want it to be. And uh, so, but it's an effort to bring quantum theories all in together into one theory and it basically has the same idea that God's not necessary because the, this universe just banged properly. It says, because there's a law such as gravity, so did he start with nothing? No, he started with a law of gravity. In other words, what he really starts with is a, is a quantum computer, and the quantum computer generates this lake of opportunity out there, and the lake is bubbling, and every bubble represents a universe. Right? And so you're not starting with nothing, you're starting with a computer that generates all these universes. It says, because there's a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing and why the universe exists and why we exist. It is not necessary to inv invoke God to light the blue torch paper and set the universe going. After all, we already got this quantum computer that did it for us. Right? So he says, according to M theory, ours is not the only universe. Instead, M theory predicts a great many other universes that were created out of nothing. Their creation does not require an intervention of some supernatural being or God. Rather, these multiple universes arise naturally from physical law, right? Naturally from nothing or from physical law, right? So he's, in other words, his computer can do everything that God can do. It's eternal, it's infinite, right? It just doesn't judge you morally, but it can do everything else, right? And so Sir Roger Penrose, he, he's a physicist, he's like, hello. He says, unlike quantum mechanics, M-theory enjoys no observational support whatsoever. Right? So is it a science or philosophy at this point? It's entirely philosophical because you can't study it. It has no predictive value. It's, it's just uh, wishful thinking, basically. And um, I, this is an interesting video because I really like Michael Kiku. Uh, but he also describes how the universe basically costs nothing. And so I, I'd just like to show you this short little clip about this. Look, I went the wrong way. Aha. All right, here we go. And so the universe could essentially be nothingness 
which was unstable and created a soap bubble. Now you may say to yourself, well that can't be right, because that violates the conservation of matter and energy. How can you create a universe from nothing? Well, if you cal calculate the total matter of the universe, it is positive. If you calculate the total energy of the universe, it is negative because of gravity. Gravity has negative energy. When you add the two together, what do you get? Zero. So it takes no energy to create a universe. Universes are for free. A universe is a free lunch. And then you may say to yourself, well, that can't be, right? Because positive and negative charges don't cancel out. Therefore, how can the universe be made out of nothing? Well, if you calculate the total amount of positive charge in the universe, and calculate the total amount of negative charge in the universe, and you add it up, what do you get? Zero. The universe has zero charge. Well, what about spin? Galaxies spin, right? But they spin in all directions. If you add up all the spins of the galaxies, what do you get? Zero. So in other words, the universe has zero spin, zero charge, and zero matter energy content. In other words, the universe is for free. <laughs> so the universe it came from nothing, and it, and it is nothing, basically. It's just uh, properly arranged nothingness, right? So how did you get the arrangement, though? See, he doesn't talk about this arrangement. Basically, if you boil the universe down, it boils down to information. Information is the building block of everything. Uh, and where did the information come from? No one talks about that. The information, though, is extreme. Again, when that Big Bang banged, it had to be informationally precise to one part and 10 to the 10 to the 123, right? Extremely extreme precision. And so Penrose, he's, he's talked about this as informational entropy. Uh, and where did this entropy come from? Where did, where did this extreme information come from? And a lot of physicists now say, well, it had to come from a mind, right? Uh, a mind of some kind, but then that disturbs a lot of physicists because it, uh, uh, coming from a mind make, kind of makes you uneasy thinking, well, maybe we came from God, right? And so then you try to get around this idea of coming from a mind by making multiple universes, uh, infinite number of universes, so you don't have to admit that, hey, this information had to come from somewhere. Uh, information just doesn't pop out of nothingness unless you have gazillion numbers of other universes where it can just happen by random chance. And so, just to show you the, the situation, the banging of the universe, it's like a tornado where every tornado that you ever knew, it built houses instead of tearing them down. So here's a video, video clip. <laughs> so, and that's actually, that, that degree of precision, that's actually not as precise as the bang of the universe. The bang of the universe had to be much more precise than that, like every tornado would build instead of tear things down. And so you're like, well, well, how do you get around that? How do naturalists explain that? If that would have happened, you would say, well, that was designed. Obviously, that was designed. That's not a normal tornado, right? This is a magical tornado. And they're like, well, no, and the only way that they can explain it is because there's infinite numbers of universes and this is bound to happen occasionally in one of those universes. That's how they explain it. Um, so, and, but they really strive really hard to make something come from nothing. This is like a foundational scientific uh, goal for most of these guys, pretty much everyone who believes naturalistically and comes to this conclusion. It's either designed or we have to believe that everything came from nothing. And so here's uh, Dawkins trying to explain this. I'm not so at ease with that as you seem to be because it does seem to me that if there is a supernatural, superhuman intelligence that worked it all out, in a way that undermines the entire scientific enterprise because we are, maybe, maybe an evolutionary biologist feels this more strongly, the whole enterprise of evolutionary biology is to explain how you get prodigious complexity and design from virtually nothing. I mean, we hand over to physicists when we, we can go beyond the virtually nothing to the absolutely nothing. Um, <laughs> but, um, That's Steve Green. He's a physicist. So, 
But how, if, that's if, more if the deistic God thought all that through and set up the laws of physics, then he would have to be damn clever. He, he would have to be a, a, the physicist to end all, fi all physicists. I don't care if he then with, withdraws. He needs an explanation in his own right. And uh, it seems to me that the noble scientific enterprise is to, is to start from as near nothing as you can get. Yeah. The noble scientific enterprise is to start from as near nothing as you can get. Right? So, so occasionally, though, scientists like Krauss, they become honest when they're cornered. And this doesn't happen very often, but on rare occasions, they become honest. And so Krauss, who wrote that book, A Universe from Nothing, right? This is what he said during a radio interview. He was asked this interesting series of questions, and this is how he responded. He said, do you see any evidence of purpose for the universe? And Krauss says, well, maybe I would believe if all the stars lined up and spelled out a message from God, you know, like, hey, Krauss, this is God just stopping by to say hi. Right? Maybe I would believe then. And he says, uh, Briarly uh, asked him a very interesting response here. He says, actually, no, that wouldn't be evidence for God on your multi from your multi-universe view. If there's an infinite number of universes existing for an infinite amount of time, then anything can happen no matter how unlikely it is. Therefore, no evidence could convince you that God exists since the unobservable, untestable, eternal multiverse can make anything it wants. Right? How in the world is he going to respond to this? It's like two-headed cows shouldn't surprise you, right? This is my two-headed cow. Ten-headed cows. You know, angels dancing on a pin. Uh, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger winning the lottery ten times in a row. I mean, nothing should surprise you. It's all bound to happen occasionally in the right universe, right? By random chance. No design needed. And so how does he respond to this question that seems pretty obvious? And it's like, well, he, he's honest. He says, that's a true statement. I was shocked when I saw this. He says, that's a true statement. He says, you talk about this God of love and everything else, but somehow if you don't believe in him, you don't get any of the benefits. So you have to believe. And then if you do anything wrong, you're going to be judged for it. I don't want to be judged by God. And that's the bottom line. Right? Yeah. So is it about physics or science or evidence or anything like that? No. It's about judgment, right, of all things. I don't want to be judged, and that's the bottom line, so I'm going to invent a God that doesn't judge me, right? And so, and what about us as Christians? Like, I, I don't want to be judged either. But the thing about Christians is that uh, judgment has already been taken care of by God, and Christ has taken my judgment for me, and now judgment is given in favor of the saints. I was like, well, that's a problem. I'm not really that saintly, right? Uh, the problem is, uh, what's nice, though, is that God defines saints very broadly, right? Like David is a saint, right? And David was as wormy as it gets, pretty much, right? And so I take, ho I take hope in the, in the lives of these saints that weren't very saintly in the Bible because being a friend of God is not your responsibility to fix yourself, right? God says, I will make in you a new heart. Right? I will create in you a new heart. So it's not me having to make myself better and more saintly. All I have to do is be a friend of God, and God's going to take care of me right? and fix me up. So uh, this is why we don't, as Christians, have to worry about this judgment problem that naturalists have to worry about. So here's a little clip to illustrate this. Um, the theory of evolution. Why, why are you so happy? Oh, are you kidding? Because I have hope. Hope? Mm -hmm. You know, in the assurance that I have a purpose. A purpose. Mm -hmm. You can have one too, you know. I want one. <laughs> what are you talking about? Everybody wants to have a purpose. That's not true. Some people want to hold to the unproven fact that we're nothing more than a bunch of protoplasmic goo that evolved over billions of years and will end up as cosmic garbage, therefore serving no one or no purpose at all. No hope or purpose? Right. That's so sad. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd rather have no hope and no purpose in order to avoid judgment. That's the whole thing. That's the bottom line. Right? And so... I'm, I propose to you that the Bible is uh, not only just more hopeful as it describes the reality of the place that we live, the universe that we live, it's also more reasonable. And uh, so let's just look a little bit about this. I mean, Jeremiah describes this. He says, it's not really a head problem, it's a heart problem. He says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your science, right? No, it's not really a problem of science. It's a problem of do you want to find God or not, right? And so... David also says, he says, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. David doesn't pull any punches, right? He just says, you're an idiot, right? <laughs> and, so, and, and so let's look a little bit about that. Here's, again, the galaxies. These are stars, uh, not just stars, these are galaxies. 
And so uh, David says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out throughout all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. And so, and David didn't even know the half of it unless he was shown in vision or something about what we know today. It should be much more impressive to us today than it was to David in David's day. And so I'm telling you that it's not just the blue dot that's important. Uh, it's what's on the blue dot. That it, it's, it almost boggles your mind. I mean, here's a God who it says in the Bible that knows every hair of your head. He's concentrated on you as an individual. I mean, for some of us, I guess, Greg, right? We have less counting to do, right? But <laughs> other, <laughs> make it easy for him. <laughs> but he's really concentrated on us as individuals, right? We're precious as individual beings. In fact, uh, in Luke, it says, indeed, the very heads of your hair are numbered. Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Now, why did, I'm glad he threw in the sparrows part, because why did he throw in the sparrows? It's because God is actually interested in sparrows, right? He's concerned when a sparrow falls wounded to the ground. So obviously he's going to be concerned about you as an individual human being. And so I'm, I'm glad that God likes sparrows. You know, it's, it's a neat little uh, aside. By the way, you're worth more than many sparrows. And I like sparrows, right? And it says uh, here in Psalms again, you search me, O Lord. And you know me, you know, when I sit down and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in and behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. You know, you're, I'm sorry, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. In other words, he knows the future even. He knows what we're going to do before we do it. He knows what we're going to say before we say it. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And we, we should know it even fuller weller today, right? My frame is not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Lots of things seem to outnumber the grains of the sand, right? So, and the precision, as far as we discussed, the universe of, of uh, the nature of the well-balanced planet, uh, even the simplest living thing, the simplest bacterium, informationally speaking, is more complex than anything we've already talked about. And so, uh, God is interested in extreme details, and we can talk about the math of that later on. I don't have time to get into it for this lecture. The problem is, though, is that when we look at ourselves, we don't seem very valuable. Because the Bible even says that we're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked, and uh, we're not catching on. And so how can God have given up everything to come and save somebody like me, who's a wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked, who is in open rebellion and has very little redeeming qualities, if any. And so it's interesting that the angels stood amazed that God was willing to sacrifice so much for an apparently hopeless cause. And um, what's interesting, though, is that God doesn't see me or you as we currently are, but as what he can turn us into, what we can become. And um, I have an interesting quote here from Ellen White that's kind of hopeful to me. She says, Christ, the brightness of the Father's glory, beheld humanity in its wretchedness and sinfulness. He beheld souls tainted with corruption, depraved and deformed. He knew that the fallen race tended more toward evil than to good and practiced the most hateful vices. The heavenly host looked upon the world as undeserving of the sympathy and love of God. Angels marveled that Christ should undertake to save man and his lost and as it seemed to them, hopeless condition. They marveled that God should tolerate a race so foul with sin as to be a blot upon his creation. They could see no room for love, but Christ saw this, that souls must perish unless a strong arm to deliver was reached forth to save. Right? So the angels like, just write them off. They're a little speck of dust anyway. Right? What's the big deal? But here's David, one of the wormiest people in the Bible. 
And he said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And then God responded and said, okay, I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Now that's a big deal. Uh, what does it cost God to make a universe? Right? Like, snapping, it's done. You know, most of the creation he just spoke into existence. Like, you know, for Adam, I guess he got his hands dirty a little bit. But no big deal, right? But what does it cost him to create a new heart? Right? He says, Ellen White says, the conversion of the human soul is of no little consequence. It is the greatest miracle performed by divine power. And uh, how can we say that? He said, because it's this metamorphosis, cr God creating a new creature from somebody who's deliberately fallen and rebelled against him. How does that happen? Well, it can only happen with emptying heaven. It, God had to give himself to do it, the greatest sacrifice of himself. He had to come and not just die, but be willing to not exist. It says that Christ could not see through the portals of the tomb. He didn't see, I mean, before he came, I'm sure he knew, but when he was on the cross, he was not sure that he would be uh, able to make it through this, right? But he's still willing to go through it so that we could make it through it, right? And that's a huge difference than making a universe or something that didn't cost him anything. This cost him everything. And so it kind of puts the whole story of the lost sheep into perspective. God, Jesus, when he tells the story, it's like he's got 90 and 9 and 1. But, I mean, here we're talking about 2 trillion galaxies that we can see. You know, let's just say there's one habitable world on each of those galaxies. How many, how many beings did he really leave behind to come and save our little world? It kind of puts that into perspective. He left a lot behind, a lot more than the parable gives credit for. And uh, just to save not just our world, but to, he would have done it for each one of us as individuals, me as an individual person, as if I was the only one on the planet, or even in the universe. And uh, visions about this, what's interesting about this little blue dot concept, we're, we're in a backwater, a know-nothing uh, place that's pretty much irrelevant, but we're told in the Bible that the New Jerusalem is going to be come here and that God is going to live with us on this little pale blue dot in the middle of nowhere. It says, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, come down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man and he will live with them on their tiny blue dot. And he will be their people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the former things have passed away. Now, you know, the, the Milky Way galaxy is fairly large for a galaxy, like four times larger than average. And I, I'm thinking that maybe this was done, but who knows? Because if this is the center of the universe eventually, we have to have a place for people to come visit, right? And we, we can't all fit them all on this tiny blue dot. They're going to have to stay in elsewhere around the Milky Way. I'm sure they're ambassadors in order to kind of make it here occasionally when they have when they get called up for interviews, right? And so I think as we're, we're, we don't even have in mind what's gonna happen with our future. Uh, we're gonna actually be able to sit on the throne of God, uh, which Satan wanted to do and never was able to do. And now Christ says, well, now I'm human. I'm gonna sit on God and you guys are gonna come and sit with me on the throne. That blows my mind. And here we are on this tiny blue dot and God's gonna live with us. We're gonna be the center of the universe all because uh, of Christ's sacrifice for us. This is uh, unbelievable. We can't even comprehend what's going to happen. In this light, consider that the God who cares for the extreme details of the universe, who has every atom and every hair of your head in mind, who suffers when even a little sparrow falls wounded to the ground, has not only our little blue dot of a world in, in mind as if it were the only world in the universe, but has you and me in mind as if we were the only people in the universe, each engraved on the palms of his hands. You see, it says in John, greater love is no one than this, that he's laid down his life for his friends. Not just servants, but friends, right? And see, I've engraven you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. And Ellen White again stepped to Christ. The relation between God and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the planet Earth, right? You and God can have a relationship as if no one else existed, even in the universe, and um, which is kind of mind-blowing to me as well. How can the God of the universe who made everything like that uh, consider me such a close friend that it can be so close that 
that our relationship could be uh, unique as if nobody else existed. Um, of course, all this is just theory. You have to try it out for yourself. You have to taste and see that the Lord is good for you. And uh, I like vanilla ice cream, and no one can argue with me because I've tasted it. I like it. Right? The same thing with your relationship with God. You have to try it out between you and God and see if you like it or not. If you don't like it, what's the point? Right? And, but you have to have your own experiences. And just for me, it, it kind of helps to hear experience of others on, on occasion. And um, my boys have helped me a lot. Um, both Wesley and Bradley have had miracles in their lives that are undeniable to me. We were just in Maui a couple weeks ago, swimming at the beach, doing body surfing and boogie boarding. And uh, Bradley was out there, and uh, a big wave came and just rolled him, just spun him around and, and rolled him over and over. And uh, he lost his goggles. And he needs the goggles because the water's salty and it hurt his eyes. And uh, these goggles uh, sink. They don't float. And so they're gone. I mean, here's a, a four-foot wave uh, rolling and all the murky water, and there's no way to find these things. They're gone. And so he's like, oh, i got to have them. I was like, well, I'm sorry, Bradley. They're gone. We're going to have to go buy some later. The swimming is done for today, I guess. And so he, pray, he folds his hands there, and he prays, Dear God, please bring me back my goggles so I can still keep swimming today. And then he opens his eyes, and immediately when he opens his eyes, the goggles pop up next to him, he picks them up, puts them on, thank you, God, and dives back into the wave. And I was like, what in the world? It's like the floating ax. I wouldn't have believed it. I was standing right next to him. And then that evening, he prays. Uh, he, Wesley had seen a sea turtle, the green turtle, the day before snorkeling. And so he wanted to see one. So he's like, please, God, I want to see a sea turtle tomorrow. And so we were out there doing more body surfing and and. Uh, and and the, and the waves were coming in. And as I was looking down in the, in the wave, here goes the sea turtle right next to us. I mean, I could touch him. And so I was like, Bradley, there's your sea turtle. And he's like, oh, yeah, there's my sea turtle. I, just, I knew it would happen. I was like, this is amazing. So the, your kids can kind of inspire you as you go along. This is Bradley with his attractive goggles. <laughs> and uh, there's the sea turtle. So just in summary, uh, you know, God looks at us like the pearl of great price. He talks about this pearl of great price. And um, we are the pearl of great price. He's given up everything to buy us. It cost him everything to buy us. But it, this pearl of great price works both ways. You know, not only are we the pearl of great price, but it's like if God has given everything to save us, how do we view Christ? Christ is also the pearl of great price. And you, and you need to look back and say, what am I willing to give up for him uh, to... Uh, and, and Paul says, well, let me see. Let me, let me look at all the stuff I can give up. And so he looks at all the things that he considered valuable, right? He starts listing them off. He lists off about a dozen of these things that he considered valuable. And then he, and he gets at the end and he looks back on all the stuff that he thought he was giving up for God. And he says, it's all garbage, right? And he said, God, I, all I have is garbage to give up. And then God says, I'll take it, right? I'll take your garbage and I'll, I'll, I'll turn it into something special. So just some, some thoughts for you to consider for today, and I, I appreciate this opportunity to be with you. And if you have any questions, uh, now's a good time. So, yeah. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a, just a technical question, but you mentioned about how water has such a high specific heat. I've always often wondered why the longest day of the year isn't the hottest day of the year. It usually lags by a month or two. And then the coldest day, the same thing. Is that because the specific heat takes that long for the heat to absorb? And then it takes that way after the short state for it to be lost from? Yeah, I guess the best way I can explain it is a desert. The desert has very little water in the atmosphere. So it gets extremely cold at night and then extremely hot in the day. And there's no mitigating influence. But if you live in a place where the humidity is higher, it doesn't get so cold at night or hot in the day and because of the, the specific heat of water that does that. And so without it, you, you have these huge temperature swings, but with it, it kind of evens things out. So. You know, 70% of the Earth's surface is water, so I think that probably, um, in my mind, it could, could cause a lag factor. Oh yeah, definitely. It takes some time for it to release its heat and to absorb it as well. So, Oh, thanks, Stephanie. Good to see you. My, my boys were saying today, hey, Dad, that's your cousin up there playing. I was like, it's your cousin too. And they were like, really? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So.
So anyway, anybody else? No. Uh, yeah. We use the language of the Big Bang. Isn't there a better way to conceive of something happening than the Big Bang? Well, I don't know. Maybe it, maybe it did bang into existence, uh, but I, I think it was a design bang. You know, because what's, what's nice about the bang idea, about the Big Bang, is that before the Big Bang came along, scientists, physicists used to believe, and uh, it was, uh, uh, the, the, the Big Bang came from uh, Frederick Hoyle, the term Big Bang. Big, Frederick Hoyle didn't believe in the Big Bang. He used it as a derogatory term, saying he believed in an infinite universe that was infinite in size and ancient, like it, it never had a beginning, and age. And so he, when it, this Big Bang idea came along, he didn't believe in it. He says, oh, you stupid people who believe in that Big Bang, right? But the, what's interesting about the Bang is that a universe that has a beginning uh, means uh, much more in favor of a god. Uh, something that has a beginning that was created out of nothing, that's much more in line with the Christian idea of God than it is with this idea of an eternal universe that can make anything it wants. And so it forced a lot of physicists to reconsider the idea of God. When, this, when, the, when the information came in, the universe had a beginning, that made a lot of physicists Christian, or not just Christian, or some kind of believer in God at least. I kind of like the idea of a bang, that <laughs> at least it's the banging properly. Yeah. Uh, the way I think of it is um, the physicists have a certain specific description of the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. I, my suspicion is that, if, that we don't quite have all the data. If we, had, if we had it all, we would see that what we see as the Big Bang was more or less right, but that's the way God did it, but he did it more sophisticated than what, how we understand it. Yeah, it wasn't like a bomb going bang or a firecracker or something like that. It was a very specific thing. Well, this particle, you go over here, and you go over here, it's precisely right there. And you go precisely right there. You know, and it was a very precise bang, right? It's not like a, just a random bang. It's a, it was just a bang where God says, let it be, boom, and there was light, right? That kind of bang is a very precise, creative bang. Yeah. Are you rewriting John 1.1? 1, 1? In the beginning was the bang? <laughs> <laughs> no, because in the very beginning, there was no... Be I mean, and John is saying in the very beginning was the word, right? And so what I'm saying is that what a lot of physicists are saying today, that the universe and everything that we see, there's no really solid material anything. Everything is ultimately based on information. And it's interesting that John calls Christ the word. Right? And now physicists are saying, well, everything really is the word. And uh, nothing exists except in the mind. And it's almost like we're living in a mental projection at this point where God, it, you know, if God forgot, it's not like just God has your hairs of your head numbered. It's like if God forgot about the hairs of your head, they wouldn't exist, which maybe happened to some of us. You know? <laughs> it, it, you know, so everything that exists, exists within the mind of God. And without God, there is nothing. With, and that's what John 1 says. Without him, nothing exists that has been made that has been made or however he says it. Uh, with, and he, he's behind everything that is that has been made. Except there's some things that haven't been made, right? Like wisdom. Wisdom with, with God from the beginning. Wisdom didn't have a beginning. And in some ways, my mathematics friend, I, I used this for Vespers the other day. I was like, you know, math never had a beginning. Math is eternal because math is logic and wisdom and all these things are kind of mathematical. And that probably originated with God himself and never had a beginning. And so my, my mathematician friend loved that. He's like, math is eternal. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm sure some people don't like that idea. But <laughs> other people think it's kind of cool. So. Yeah. Oh, this is just a, uh, I'm wondering. <clears throat> I very much appreciated uh, what you said here and uh, your emphasis on uh, God's love in the uh, discussion and so on, we here in this class tend to stick with science, and I uh, I wonder if we're inadequate in too narrow an approach. Uh, how do you? Science is so extremely successful and so highly respected. 
do we need to concentrate on uh, seeing how we can get a little bit out of that uh, closed system uh, into the broader perspective of the meaning of life and so on? Uh, I don't have an answer here. I'm asking the question, uh, are we derelict? Uh, well, I think in, for some people, I can only speak for myself. I know Paul said he went to Athens and he, he gave a kind of a scientific talk, sort of, well, at least a philosophical talk on Mars Hill. And he only won like a handful of converts. And he was very disturbed by this. And he said, well, I'm, from now on, I'm not going to mention, I'm not going to deal with that anymore. And any more la rational ideas or science or philosophy, I'm only going to talk about Christ and my own experience with Christ. And that's it. And that's where I have the most success. And that's what I'm going to do. And I was like, well, great. You know, that, that probably works for like 95% of people, right? But he did win a handful of people on Mars Hill. And for me, in my own perspective, if it hadn't been for somebody like Paul coming along and talking about the science, about uh, God's nature and how it is God's, and how the science actually supports the Bible and supports God, I probably wouldn't be in the church today. I mean, there's those 5% of people whose science is a big deal, right? And, and for me, I'm, a, I'm one of those 5%. I'd probably not be in the church today if I felt that Darwinism favored uh, naturalistic ideas or that we really did come from nothing or anything like that, I would probably have not be in the church because it, it's just not enough for me to have a nice, uh, lovely fairy tale. The loveliness and beauty of the Bible is not enough for me. And so for some people it is. Some people look at the beauty of an attractiveness of Christianity and that's enough. But other people say, well, what are the details? And I'm one of those detail people. And if, and, and if it wasn't that I saw the beauty in nature and, and pointed it to a designer, I probably wouldn't accept the Bible for, for any of its other claims. So. Two things, <clears throat> excuse me, two things. The Big Bang. If you ever go to a, uh, a water, uh, not water, firework show, over here at Redlands even, and there's a lot of Big Bangs. Some just produce light, some produce uh, fuzz and whatever. Every now and then they throw in one that makes Mickey Mouse. Right, yeah. You know, it, it's, they pack it so good, you can get the ears over here and the ears <laughs> over here, eyes where they should be. You know, everything has a place. Yeah. And so if God has a big firecracker and he <laughs> loaded it with stuff and blew it up, then he gets what he wanted to get. I, I don't see a, yeah, that's very much a, a problem with a big bang that God's right in the middle of. Yeah. And the second question is this multiverse thing. Where did that come from? Is there any scientific evidence that these smart people would say, oh, it could happen if we got... It uh, came from math, uh, ironically. It came from this, uh, the quantum theories, the different quantum theories. They're trying to organize them all into one theory and make them all work together. But see, with math, math isn't really a hard science by itself. You can invent whole other worlds that were, would work very differently than our universe with math that would actually work, right? And so there's like, well, it would work. And so maybe it exists, right? Mathematically, it could happen. I was like, but math is not the same thing as science. You can have a perfectly beautiful mathematical theory and it describes the, the real world, how it should work, and, you're, and then, well, now you have to test it against the real world to see, does it actually work against the real world? And that's where science comes into play. Your, your theory, however beautiful it may be, it's like Einstein. One beautiful theory can be ruined by one ugly fact, right? <laughs> and so that's where science comes into play. Sean, I have a question. Yeah. The, the, what's interesting is that uh, in quantum mechanics, the scientists are actually getting to the point where they can't explain things. They're getting to the point where there's things that don't make any sense. And the, and the, the one that, I, that keeps coming to my mind is, is the particle and the wave. How does, how does the particle or wave know that it's being looked at? How does it, in, in one experiment, it even knew before it was looked at? We don't have any way to explain that. And so there's a point where rationality breaks well, down. Well, this was very disturbing to Einstein, right? Yeah, exactly. He didn't like this idea that one atom here who could be a mirror of an atom over here, and then you, you play with this atom, and the same thing happens to that atom across the universe. Right? He hated that idea. He's called it spooky ad action at a distance. Correct. Oh, he hated that. 
Yeah, so there's things that boggle my mind that I can't understand at all. So, and, so the point of all that is, is uh, and another thought is, if, if we took the 12 disciples and made them all living today, which one would be the scientist? Thomas. It would be Thomas. Right. And so the, the point is, is that Thomas would, the way to get to Jesus is not by looking constantly for evidence, evidence, evidence. You're, you're never going to know the infinite mind of God by searching it out. Because Christ said, you see, you believe because you see, but blessed are they that believe and have not seen. Have not seen directly, but I do think that a certain amount of evidence, at least for someone like me, is required. And, and even with Thomas, Jesus worked with him, right? Jesus did say, he didn't say, well, Thomas, you're such an idiot, right? What he said is, come stick your finger in my hand and in my side, you know, take what you need. But blessed are those who don't have this kind of direct evidence, but still can see my signature behind the things that I've made, right? Um, my comment will be about this, how the success of science. <clears throat> we, we're very impressed with what the physicists have to say. And physicists, physics is sometimes referred to as the queen of the sciences. But really physics is pretty simple. I mean, where it gets complex is when you're dealing with biology and geology, things like that. <clears throat> and for instance, um, geological theories that we sometimes call conventional theories, that's the millions of years, everything happens very slowly and all that. And I have friends that say, well, that, that works so well. Well, in reality, it works well for people who all accept the same assumptions. Right. The assumptions of, law of millions of years and no God. If you don't accept those assumptions, and you start opening your eyes and asking questions, we find that conventional geology doesn't work very well at all. Uh -huh. and, and molecular biologists are realizing that Darwinian theory doesn't work at all. It's even and worse so, for molecular biologists, yeah. Pardon? It's even worse for molecular biologists. Absolutely. It's like, anyway. I yeah. And so, um, yeah, f uh, science works fine for things that, that are relatively easy to comprehend. Yeah, well, that doesn't mean, I mean, not easy in the sense like for most of us, but it, it's less complicated than the th when we start studying the past, geological history and biological history. Yeah, it works really well with things that can give you, where you can do an experiment and you can see the results right on your table, right? Science works great for that. But when you, where the problems come in, especially with molecular biology and dating of rocks and things, is that here we have an experiment, it works great on this table, right? And I can predict things, and, and, and I can predict things 10 minutes ago and, and a few years ago and five days in the future, I can do all that stuff, right? And where, where it comes in the problems is saying, well, this predictability that works really well here in this limited sphere, I can extrapolate, therefore, infinitely in the past and infinitely in the future, and it's always going to work in all situations, all circumstances, just like it works here on this table. And that's where science runs into some problems, because the extrapolations, when you start asking questions about these extrapolations, then there are serious problems with them. Uh, in fact, in molecular biology in particular, that's, that's what convinced me that Christianity was right, is that you can see an exponential decay of evolvability. Things evolve just fine on the table. Antibiotic resistance and, and drug resistance and all these things work really well. And even some novel enzymes can evolve at low levels uh, on the table in real life. I can see them where they started and where they ended up, all that in real time. And then, but when you extrapolate higher and higher levels of functional complexity, all of a sudden your, your time requirement goes up exponentially. It's just like And people don't realize that. The scientists say, well, this should work in a linear manner, right? And it's not linear. That's the problem. It's exponential. So, yeah. Well, I consider God is outside of time and space. So uh, time is only for this earth as I understand it. So how could we possibly date things? Well, because, well, I think you can date things. It's just the extrapolations are difficult as you yeah. go farther and farther back. The reason why I think, and I believe God is out time, uh, side of time and space as well, but he made our time and space so that we could understand it, yeah. right? And so he's working with us in a way that we can comprehend. And the problem is, is as we're trying to comprehend our universe and our world, is that uh, we extrapolate too far beyond what we actually know. We have a limited data set that we can actually comprehend, and we try to use that limited data set to go too far beyond what we, what we can actually prove or demonstrate, and then we, then we treat it like it's really hard science and reality. 
where it's not. It's like it got full of holes and full of, of potential problems that no one talks about. So, yeah. One more. There are some really uh, small miracles, small in quotes, uh, that are so much a part of the anthropic principles you've been talking about. It's always impressed me when, when man looks for evidence of life elsewhere in the universe, they look, first of all, for signs of water being present. The water, in some ways, is just simply miraculous. Yeah, very. Uh, someone designed it so that when you got an oxygen and hydrogen near each other, they didn't share electrons equally. If they shared electrons equally, water would vaporize at about minus 170 degrees. But it's that attraction together with these slight charges that make water all really the miraculous substance it is. And yeah, of course, no. uh, to me, that says an awful lot about design. Yeah. Because you put, you put water in a series of similar molecules where you have, in place of oxygen, you have one of the other similar atoms. They're Definitely, vapor. Yeah. yeah, it just seems like it was totally set up. And there's so many miraculous things about water, just water by itself. Exactly. Like, wow. And, how, and actually, it is the hydrogen bonding that results from that that gives yeah. water its temperature buffer effect and sol sol solvent effects and all these and other things. And that's just things. one molecule. Then you start talking about organic chemistry and then you got carbon. Yes. Another totally, in fact, totally. Car carbon uh, Hoyle, Sir Frederick Hoyle, he, he made a prediction about carbon and, and uh, its uh, uh, atomic energy, I think it was. And that's so precise and, and a lot of people think it was outrageous unless it was designed to be that way. And so all these things, multiple different aspects of the universe and of uh, atomic atoms and molecules seem designed. And so it's just, if you look at it, you're like, well, how can you resist? And uh, the only way you can resist is by looking stupid. I, I mean, basically saying, well, I just don't want to be judged. Right? <laughs> That's the only way. Yeah. I know that, of course, you're heavy emphasis on the visuals of uh, the world's greatest minds, mathematicians, and they very um, pridefully said that the sum total of all the negative charges in the universe and the sum total of all the positive charges is zero, therefore there is nothing. And I was kind of waiting and hoping for you to uh, debunk that because of all people sitting in this room I'm the stupidest in terms of mathematics but it's obvious to me even me that we're talking about balance we're talking about a dynamic equilibrium not zero so uh, well, please yeah. expand on that well, it is zero as far as absolute charges are concerned, and absolute spins, they all add up to And zero. to that, I would say, so what? Right, but the, it's not zero, and what I talked about a little bit, it's not zero when it comes to the information to make the dynamic equilibrium. It, to, to create a dynamic equilibrium between equal charges, like on opposite sides, that takes a great deal of precision and uh, information to do that. And that's where the problem comes in for physicists and where you have to have all these multiple universes and where you don't want to be judged anymore, right? Yeah. In the last Olympics, there were things shown in the sky. I have no idea how it was done. Drones. But They were used thousands of drones. But was it Elijah and his servant that were surrounded by enemy troops? Yeah. And then angels were made to appear and yeah. I assume disappear when they were no longer needed. Yeah. There is a realm of knowledge that we don't even dabble in, I think. Yeah, and that's where personal stories comes in. We were just reading about this with my kids, these, these children's stories uh, based on the past history of miracles in the guide, the reader's guide. And uh, one of the stories, very impressive, this man had just lost his job at work and his daughter was praying for him at home, his little 
my five-year-old daughter was praying for him at home, and it was wintertime, and uh, the doorbell rings, and she goes, in, the mother and the father just doesn't want to talk to him, and he's angry, and he says, you know, tells the little girl, go answer the door. So she goes to answer the door. It's this uh, six-foot-two uh, guy in, in slacks and a, and a checkered shirt and a big beard. And she describes it and the color of his eyes and everything. And he, he says, I'd like to speak to your father if he's home, you know. I have something for him. And so she goes and tries to get him, and he yells back, I don't want to talk to him. And so she says, well, my mother may be coming. You know, I hear her coming. And while the mother's coming, he's talk she starts talking to this guy. And he bends down, and the Christmas tree is there. And he says, you have a lovely Christmas tree. And I noticed the angel on top. And, he, and she asks him, do you believe in angels? She, and he says, of course I do. He's like, don't you believe in angels? And the little girl is like, well, I'm not sure. I, how would I even know if I saw one? And the, the man says, well, you would know because the angels always let you know that you saw an angel uh, when they leave. And he says, that's, that's how you know. And, uh, but it's just a sign from God that God still loves you and God cares about you. And so the mother came to the door and, and he says, well, I'd, re I'd really like to see your husband if at all possible. I hate to interrupt your, your evening and anything. And, and he says, well, he, he's, he thought, he's just swearing and cussing. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't care if he's the pope <laughs> or whatever. And so he pulls out this uh, envelope and hands it to the lady. And he says, just let him know that tomorrow he needs to go back and apply for his job because his job will be waiting for him. And uh, so then she, the mother goes out inside and the girl turns around as the mother opens the envelope and it's $300 in the envelope. And then they turn back around and the man's not there. And also it's two feet of snow and there's no prints in the snow. So uh, I think those stories start to reveal another world. And that's like, those stories are important, like these miracle stories that I have in my own life, that you have answers to prayer, that you know God cares about you personally. This is where you can taste the ice cream and it's not science, right? You taste the ice cream and you don't have to have a peer review study on it, right? You say, and somebody says, well, I don't agree with you. And you say, so what? I tasted it for myself. I like it. You don't have to like vanilla. I like it. I, the ice cream, you have to taste it for yourself and see if you like it or not. I, I can't have your experience for you. But my experience tells me a lot about God, that he cares for me personally, and it has nothing to do with science, which is nice as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry that I missed who you are and what you do. Oh, I'm uh, Sean Pittman. I'm a pathologist, graduated from here. I'm up in Redding, California now. My hobby is oh, okay. creation. Oh, okay. And I learned that I, I, I grew up in, the, uh, in a Christian, my dad's a pastor. I grew up as a, in the Adventist church. And uh, from early childhood, I started wondering about Darwinism, the story that you hear, and how you can have all kinds of different cats and dogs and all kinds of different colors of roses, red ones, yellow ones, blue ones, black ones. And ha where's the limits to this Darwinian change over time? And my parents couldn't answer. My teachers couldn't answer my questions to my satisfaction. And even here in medical school, I didn't get good, at least to my satisfaction, good answers to this question. And then when I went off to the Army after medical school, first time out of, outside of the Avenus ghetto, so to speak. Then my friends in the army, they're just like, how in the world can you be a Christian and a scientist or at all interested in science because you know it's bunk, right? The, the Bible is just a bunch of fairy tales. And how do you answer this Darwinian challenge? Because you know, it's, you know the science is real and that your Bible is not. And I was like, well, I have no idea. And so uh, I started to think that I might have to leave the church over that and my Christian faith. And so I was like, well, I, I'm going to have, and I was really scared. I was like, I'm really seriously going to have to look into this. And so I started with genetics because that's what I knew most about. And as I started discovering things, limitations to Darwinian mechanism was the first thing. I was like, if rubber hits the road, where's it going to hit at? You know, and it's going to hit in genetics, right? And mutations and natural selection, how far can that go? And so I started studying that and I started discovering this exponential decay curve of evolutionary progress and I started sharing this with my friends and they were shocked in the army. I mean they were more open to it than a lot of people, educators here at Loma Linda, 
were open to it. And they were very open to it. And they were the ones telling me I was crazy, right? So then I go show them, I was like, yeah, I think I'm crazy, but hey, look at this. You know, I was like, watch this. And so I was like, look at what happens to these mutations over time and how it, how it changes. And, and these gaps that grow between, uh, in sequence space between these functional islands and how, how can you get a random walk from one to the other statistically? And, and I've started sharing, and these are smart guys. These are our physicists themselves, pilots, uh, of, of the Black Hawk helicopters that were flying for me and, and the other doctors and, and uh, medical providers, and they're just shocked. They're like, we've never heard anything remotely like this ever before. You need to put this on the internet, right? And I was like, I don't know what the internet, I don't, a web design, what's that, you know? And so they helped me. They helped me design my first website and put the stuff up there, and then I started getting, asking to talk different places, like, you know, all over the country and even the world now. And so Are you online now then? Oh yeah. Okay. Detectingdesign.com, even educatetruth.com, I ended up taking that one over. Detecting design is for non-Christians, scientists, detectingdesign.com, it doesn't okay. talk about religion. Educate Truth, I guess, is more for Avenist, it gets into science and what philosophy. What was that one, that last one you said? Educatetruth.com. Educate Truth. That started because of the La Sierra situation, our own schools teaching evolution as true, right. not just as a theory. And so that kind of went from there. I was like, we shouldn't be doing this because of this, you know. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed my time here again with you guys. And uh, see you next week.